everyone. Welcome back to your sessions uh, from IC ICIT and Solarium Commission on secure supply chains. Hope you enjoy that technology break fo following um, our opening keynote by Joyce Carell. Reminder that we have other keynotes today by Robert Morgus from Solarium Commission at lunchtime but on the Solarium white paper on securing supply chains. And our closing keynote is a discussion, public-private discussion, between Admiral Mark Montgomery and Robert Strayer from uh, Solarium and ITI, respectively. But we have three panels uh, of subject matter experts in supply chain risk management to discuss um, their portion of the life cycle in life cycle security, if you would. Uh, panel number one, which I'll describe in a second, uh, is on level setting supply chain risk management activities, past, present, and future, a little bit of vision for where we need to go. Uh, panel number two is led by John Boyens, and that is the sectors or acquirers managing their risk from products and services. And panel number three is led by John Miller from ITI, uh, and it's going to be focused on tech providers managing risk from products and services they build into their system that they are providing to the sectors. Okay, so over to my first panel. So panel number one is focused on um, level setting scrim areas, um, le the activities of past, present, and future, where are we going? Um, I'll be your first speaker. I'm the director of uh, cyber supply chain risk management at Synopsys. Um, after 40 plus years in federal government, now in the commercial sector with similar challenges. Uh, Rusty Sides. Uh, Rusty has 26 years of industry experience with software development, secure consulting, and information assurance in a wide range of industries, including public sector and private sector companies. He'll be followed by Dan DeMacy. He's the president of CEO Aerocyonics and one of the founders of SAE G32 Cyber Physical Systems Security Committee. He has been active in, in this community, uh, covering emerging topics such as uh, cyber physical system security, counterfeit avoidance and detection, and overall hardware assurance. Bob Metzger is a lawyer in private practice who represents leading technology companies in diverse industries. Bob is a co-author of MITRE's Deliver on Compromise Report and is a special, was a special government employee serving on the Defense Science Board Cyber Supply Chain Task Force. So this is a graphic of all of the accomplishments from over the last 10 plus years in government and industry in cyber supply chain risk management. I think Joyce Carell hit a lot of these topics, but I'm not going to go into that, but you'll have these slides as reference material in the future. When I left federal government two years ago, I wanted to move left in the design cycle and down the technology stack. A company called Synopsys afforded me the opportunity where we're focused on hardware assurance, the left side of the slide, designing uh, electronic design automation and electrical property for chips. And the right side of the diagram, we got into about six years ago on software assurance, software integrity testing, uh, purchasing Coverity, Codenomicon, Sigical, and Blackduck to allow us to test software and uh, application security. I'm not the only one who went on to synopsis from a government employee. Uh, many of you recognize Joe Jorgenbeck and Amy Lynette, who has also joined the company. And the three of us work in the chief security office. So there's a whole variety of activities that we're engaged in from a synopsis perspective, and both uh, commercial industry and government are working together to improve supply chain risk management capabilities, improving hardware assurance, software assurance, and assured services. There's a whole range of these activities. There's links there. I'm not going to go into all of them, but just note the fact that our sponsors today are iSight and Solarium Commission. So drilling into microelectronics, um, we're focused here for hardware assurance. You can see the threats that are coming to us and that they impact our lifecycle design, foundry, assembly, test, and distribution. And we're applying countering techniques in all these areas to assure our microelectronics security. So another graphic looking at this from a threats perspective, um, where are we at in sort of the, uh, the overall application of security techniques we're using to fight off those threats. Um, more to be delivered later in this arena as, as required. So overall, when we talk about supply chain, yes, we're interested in the availability of product. Um, do we have enough sources of supply? We noted the fragility of the supply chain that Joyce talked about earlier today. 
um, but we're also interested in the integrity of the products we consume. So we're, you know, who touched the supply chain, who designed into it, and can we trust that hardware or software or service that's being built into our ecosystem? Primarily, we're focused on confidentiality, integrity, and availability, not only of the data, but the function itself. Fundamental building blocks, if you would, for cyber supply chain risk management are laid out in NIST 800-161, and that's for government agencies. And just recently, NIST 8276 laid out best practices for commercial industry. What we're really talking about is, is the advantages of globalization. Yes, it's good. We get cheaper, faster products, but let's make sure we don't trade off sustainability and security in the process. And the Deliver on Compromise covers this, and I think Bob Metzger will talk that later on. Overall, DOD and the uh, critical infrastructure and the whole, whole world in many respects um, are moving from a more custom application to COTS type designs, commercial off the shelf products and hardware and software. How do you make that fit for use determination to make sure that COTS product is good enough to be used in your ecosystem? And the 90s uh, DOD moved from mill, mill specs and mill standards, clear defense contractor designing your systems to a more commercial aspect using OMB 119 Alpha saying we're going to lean more on commercial standards. While that's true for DOD, it is probably even more true for critical infrastructure. So those critical infrastructure sectors on the right, if you would, need to develop overlays or controls, specifications and standards, measuring their risk for their individual sectors. This is applying a criticality analysis from those critical components and that risk-based approach that Joyce Carell referred to today. So in the federal government, we've laid out a risk management framework within just publications on the left side of this triangle, if you would, building up more due diligence, more trust and confidence for your most trusted systems. DOD applications are laid out where we can use NIST 800-161 as a foundation, go up to uh, Committee on National Security Systems Directive 505, and then ultimately using DOD I-5200.44 uh, for our most trusted systems and networks in DOD. Recently, 5,090 laid out some assurance levels, uh, risk levels in this domain. You'll see them on the right side and further explained here. This is an uh, area where you see a given sector laying out where they can accept risk, where they can't accept risk. This is a representative example. Every sector should be doing something like this. Whole series of activities uh, since 2019 began, um, and as I'm in the commercial sector, with executive orders coming out of the White House. I'm not gonna drill into these, but there's links in several places you can see what's been going on. Joyce talked about this a little bit this morning in the opening keynote. Uh, there's been ongoing scrim activities within DHS and CISA with the scrim task force. Lots of activities, many people you'll hear brief today are engaged in these activities. And then the Salarium Commission uh, issued their overall report on cybersecurity last March, but then followed up with a special publication, a white paper on securing supply chains in October. Robert Morgerson talked in the keynote at lunch on this topic. And then the executive order just came out uh, in February on America's supply chains, which is focused in four specific categories for a 100-day study and a year-long study for uh, given sectors. So overall, we're talking about how do we, you know, gain trust and confidence into these products we build into our ecosystems? How do we collect data in those against people, process, or technology and then provide that to the consumer so he can make reasoned decisions. Um, this was part of an overall study uh, for NSTAC uh, where I was quoted with respect to ensuring we have the ability to assess whether I see products are trustworthy, we need to evolve the science and the standard. And we're all working in this process. The big question is how can we build that digital thread of quantifiable assurance data? And then there's questions, can blockchain, machine learning, or AI help us in this arena? So this is an overarching graphic. Um, think about this graphic as we go through today. So the first panel is going to focus primarily on the left side uh, of this life cycle where we're building assured hardware, assured software, providing assured services. And those are built into the systems that are built in a technology stack across the top of this screen. Uh, they go from subcomponents to components to subsystems. Uh, to systems integration and then are provided over to those sectors who build it into their functional capabilities. So you'll see the little purple areas, the areas they might want to focus on in these arenas. So you'll see the overarching thing there of confidentiality, integrity, availability, 
which drives through all of these areas. So I've finished my portion, if you would, on hardware assurance. Uh, shortly, I'll be turning over to software assurance uh, to Rusty, and then Dan will talk systems engineering across the top with cyber physical systems. And then uh, Bob will close up uh, at, the, at the end of this with an overarching view for where we're going. So over to you, Rusty. Thank you, Don. Let me go ahead and share mine. All right, so thank you, Don. Um, just like Don was saying, he covers a good bit of the hardware that I'm gonna talk more along the software supply chain and how we can pr provide assurance around that. A um, little bit about me, I am uh, started out my career as a software developer, and then I moved into software security consulting for a number of different companies, both in the private sector and the public sector. Uh, I was actually on an Air Force project that was the Application Software Assurance Center of Excellence. I was one of their team leads, and we would do software security assessments for different Air Force bases. Um, on site with the base for a week, back at the headquarters for a week to do a, a wrap up and report and send them a good state of what their application security looked like. And as part of that, we also spent some time um, as an ISSO, ISSM capacity, moving them from DIACAP to RMF. And I've spent the last four years at my current company, which is Checkmarks. And Checkmarks is all about DevSecOps securing applications um, with one of the leading static analysis tools that are on the market, uh, recognized by Gartner and Forrester as a leader in application security testing. Um, DevSecOps is our expertise. So before we can talk about DevSecOps, we really need to kind of start with a, a level set of DevOps. And what's in a name, where did this come from? It includes a business model that was historically competitive departments where you've got operations, and development, and whenever there was a communication gap between the two, they generally had the same goal. So they were aligned in the sense that they wanted to do the same thing, but one was focused on deployment, the other was focused on development, and one was a lot more concerned about the uh, level of hardware needed, the scalability of that deployment, and keeping resources at a minimum whereas developers were a lot more focused on application functionality, getting the, the application to production and getting it out the door. So once I understood their goals together, they were a lot more inclined to work together. And a lot of this shift actually took place as there was a change in moving from waterfall to agile methodologies for development. So the traditional waterfall approach was a very long process. It generally meant that years were taken to get applications out the door. And in a process of delivering applications, generally you have a lot of requirements gathered up front. A lot of development happens in between the requirement gathering and the actual deployment of that application. And in worst case scenarios, change of contractors and government uh, contracting shops, complete change of developers, and you could have a completely different team deliver the product than originally gathered the requirements. So that's where a lot of the drivers of why Agile methodology really came into play, because Agile takes much uh, smaller approach in the sense that you're only focused on a particular delivery, and those deliveries generally happen in sprints. So as the requirements change, and you have turnover in developers or customers even, and the innovation of technology takes place, you can embrace that and deliver that in a much, um, easier way to deliver because it's more of an incremental change versus a complete whole delivery. So when DevOps comes into play, you can't have DevOps without automation. So when you're talking automation, the thing you're looking for, continuous integration, and that's where you have multiple pieces of source code and development elements coming together. And generally those are designed for the specific person or team as part of the sprint. Continuous delivery, which is an outcome of continuous integration. So you allow for constant delivery of features. Continuous testing ensures that the continuous delivery, the testing must be required as part of that process to validate. And this testing generally is more focused on the quality of the product, the features around the product. And continuous monitoring is where the automated tools can make it apparent where there's bugs, security and compliance that need to be monitored. 
DevSecOps is all about taking security and implementing and building security into the entire automated pipeline. DevOps meeting security means that with a secure process and a secure automated pipeline, you're not only delivering code that's been functionally tested, but has been security focused as well. And generally the types of products that fit into this type of DevSecOps pipeline are static analysis tools, um, static analysis tools, dynamic analysis tools, IaaS type of products, which are internet uh, interactive analysis tools, and open source analyzers and software composition analysis tools. And they fit in different parts, often very focused on the developer with a shift left focus in the sense that developers get involved early and often. And with these scans taking place and developers armed with this type of information, uh, DevSecOps really works well. So kind of taking that DevSecOps approach, how can you take your application security program and implement it in such a way that it hits this level of maturity? So generally with these six steps, and I'll walk you through each step, you can go through and build a process and a system that's proven by many successful organizations that may be facing the same challenges you have today when it comes to application security. So first and foremost, you must take care of the basics, and these are more of your traditional networking approaches, making sure you've got um, your firewalls well configured, you've got your foundation of a secure infrastructure, patch servers, good uh, password management, because it does no good to have the best application security protection for a SQL injection if you're using a weak password to begin with. So once you have a good foundation, you've got your infrastructure secure, then you need to assess, well, what applications do you have? And of the applications that you have, what technology stacks are they using? So once you have a good application inventory, you wanna make sure that you go and assess those different applications and understand the threat vectors around them. So once you have a good idea of the attack surface, then you know which tools that you need to choose. So step three, finding your weaknesses. This is where the scanning comes into play. So you have time to do vulnerability scanning, the good understanding of what applications exist and what attack services are exposed. So you wanna to choose tools that fit into the different stages of your software development lifecycle. Traditionally, dynamic application tools, DAS tools, have been used for web application pen testing, but as the AppSec industry matured, it became more apparent that shifting security left was a better approach due to the time and expense of finding security vulnerabilities late in the SDLC. If you find it earlier in the SDLC, it's cheaper and it's often a lot easier to fix. And ideally, you wanna fix it in the design phase, because that's the most flexible time and the cheapest place to make your changes. So with static app application security testing, dynamic and interactive application security testing, sometimes there's a confusion as to what these tools actually do. So with this chart, you're basically seeing that with static analysis, you're getting a good white box or inside out look from the code perspective, and you're finding the vulnerabilities at the source code level. And this offers remediation that a developer can go all the way down to the line number of the code and make their vulnerability remediations. With dynamic analysis, that's black box testing. So that's where you're essentially running a hacker in a box. And it takes a very much hacker approach in the sense that it's trying different uh, payloads that are vulnerable and malicious. And it will go and test that website to tell you what vulnerabilities exist by hammering on it and seeing what types of vulnerabilities actually were successful. With IAST, this is more of a hybrid approach. So you actually get the benefits of uh, the types of vulnerabilities that you can discover from DAST, but you also get some of the benefits of what you can discover from SAST. And this happens because while the coverage is wide, it will go in and give you results immediately and it's real time. So there's no impact to the CI CD process. And the idea that is monitoring and analyzing vulnerabilities and applications in the background while standard functional testing is taking place. Another approach of using IAST is to have it running in the background while a dynamic application security scan is running. And that would essentially drive the content to the website. And using these three tools together gives you complete coverage to really understand what vulnerabilities are in your application. Step four, address the vulnerabilities. 
Many organizations are compliance driven and they use application security tools to just find the vulnerabilities. But when it comes to really understanding and taking care of these vulnerabilities, they tend to get overwhelmed because you can generally get a large quantity of results that vary in accuracy. And if you have an application that has 50 findings and hundreds of applications in your enterprise, the AppSec program can easily look at thousands of findings and leave them wondering where to start. So a lot of organizations get stuck here. A team of security engineers working direct, directly with the developers would have to manually sift through these results, weeding out false positives, assigning issues, and getting those findings remediated in a reasonable time frame. So the best approach is to choose a tool that's accurate and focused on reducing false positives either by scanning a targeted set of criteria or a mechanism to prioritize which findings are gonna give the biggest impact in the least amount of time. Generally, a tool that's got a best fix location is a huge time saver and can reduce the fatigue of manually working through those. Step five would be to integrate and automate security. So this is really where DevSecOps comes to fit. By integrating this automation, you're able to go in and have security scans as part of the build process and also as part of the developer's workflow. So while these uh, vulnerabilities are discovered through an automated scan, you can have the issue trackers that developers are used to working with and make it a part of their standard workflow. So now they're working all of their bugs and all their security issues in line. And this is much better than sending a bunch of PDFs of security scan results to the developers because this is part of their everyday workflow. And the last step, is really to embrace security into your culture. So in order to achieve this, it's important that you focus on building an application security education program, and it should be part of every developer's onboarding process and remain accessible so they have just-in-time training whenever a new vulnerability is discovered that that developer is not familiar with. And training should not just be long hours of video and course content, it should be interactive and gamified. That way, the developer is engaged and they get an experience that they will not only benefit from, but enjoy, and they'll adopt it as part of their standard development workflow. So those are the six steps and they're proven. Many developers have actually gone in and taken advantage of this and companies are seeing results by building these steps, six steps. I'm providing these slides afterwards just to give a little reference in terms of where some of these tools fit into the SDLC and just some quick notes on exactly where the government fits in and some quotes on how application security training, DevSecOps, and all of these different tools of addressing software assurance come into play. Thank you, and I'll hand it over to Dan. Thank you, Rusty. Thank you for inviting me to this panel discussion in the next few slides. I plan to describe the vision for industry standards that will help incorporate data and analytics to help observe, orient, decide, and act on information that can execute strategic technology protection and program protection planning for critical infrastructure supported by cyber physical system security that includes quantifiable assurance in the supply chain. I've spent many years addressing problems specific to supply chain risk management, counterfeit avoidance and detection, electronic hardware assurance, and cyber physical system security. Many of you know me for my work in industry standards groups and committees focused on addressing solutions in these areas. My presentation will focus on industry standard work in the core areas of hardware assurance, software assurance, and cyber physical system security that the SAE G32 Cyber Physical System Security Committee is currently drafting. For those of you who don't know me, here is a short blurb on my organization and involvement in the topic areas of cyber physical system security, hardware and software assurance, supply chain risk management, counterfeit avoidance and detection, and advancement of talent in these areas. Through my work, I have recognized the benefits of industry standards to address complex emerging topics of a concern such as cyber physical system security and supply chain risk management. Collaboration with industry, government, and academia in the creation of standard work can help establish a baseline and roadmap and can be a powerful tool for those who want to establish controls addressing concerns in these emerging areas. I'm an advocate for industry standards 
and one of the founding members that established the SAE G32 Cyber Physical System Security Committee. The SAE G32 Committee approach to cyber physical system security is to develop standards that characterize and address the risk to cyber physical systems, assess weaknesses and vulnerabilities of the hardware, software, and firmware that are incorporated into these systems that includes assessment of risk in different domains of consideration, such as supply chain risk management, and applies controls through systems engineering and systems security engineering approach that is focused on mitigating actions that are risk based. To better understand the effort, we will start by defining key terms. So to what are cyber physical systems? To put it simply, all cyber physical systems contain brains powered and controlled by electronic parts and hardware with embedded software and firmware. We have defined cyber physical systems as a system in which a mechanism is controlled or monitored by computer-based algorithms. Examples of cyber physical systems include wearable medical devices, smart grid, autonomous vehicles, supervisory control and data acquisition systems, industrial control systems, Internet of Things systems, satellite communication systems, and embedded systems that include software, firmware, and electronic hardware. When we are thinking about cyber physical system security and system security engineering, we are talking about the physical system that starts at the design and component level with electronic parts, software, and firmware that integrates into the system and interfaces with systems of systems. Unintended vulnerabilities can be introduced with the integration of complex hardware, software, and firmware supporting the cyber physical system, and through the interfaces and interaction of the system with the real physical world and other systems that require risk mitigation and domains of consideration, such as the supply chain. Cyber physical system security includes cross-cutting domains of consideration for risk mitigation. Domains of consideration are different technical areas, which includes functional and non-functional requirements and best practices for mitigating risks and countermeasures for cyber physical system security. The committee intends to leverage existing engineering processes and existing standards addressing the domains of consideration and to overlay gaps in requirements through existing processes. Gaps identified include a holistic approach for utilizing details from the pinwheel addressing domains of consideration for requirements definition and risk mitigation, how risk is treated, such as ignore, avoid, mitigate, transfer, share, or accept, incorporating security assurance levels based on the mission and business needs and incorporating hardware and software assurance in the construct. Committee members also express the need for periodic reviews and triggering events to take into account new weaknesses and vulnerabilities discovered that could be exploited throughout the system life cycle. Here is a one-page slide that summarizes the SAE G32 mission in some of the existing standards and development through the activity. The committee anticipates there will be a number of documents and standards beyond those mentioned on this summary that will be developed over time. This slide also provides a contact at SAE to get involved. Individuals are also welcome to contact me personally to learn more and to get engaged. Now I'm going to turn it over to Bob. Thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, it's really my privilege to, uh, to be on this uh, program. Uh, I am gonna talk a little bit about the past, the present, and hopefully more about the future. Uh, before I start, I'll give you a tiny background. Um, I'm a lawyer in private practice, as Dan mentioned, and I do work in the areas of acquisition, regulation, IP, and litigation. But in the work that I do in cyber and supply chain security, frankly, what I try is to employ my um, experience in those uh, substantive domains uh, to try to, to assist um, government and industry in responding to contemporary cyber and supply chain threats. Uh, we live in a very difficult world, as everyone knows. So the fact is that we are facing grave threats to our supply chain. Way back in 2013, which seems forever ago, the Defense Science Board came up with um, an equation for the determination of risk that has stood the test of time fairly well. 
we think about threat, vulnerability, and consequences. Well, the one thing I can say about the eight intervening years is that the threats have gotten better, more capable, and more dangerous. Vulnerabilities uh, seem to be discovered uh, every day and exploited faster than we could fear. And the consequences are, are growing in their significance as well as in the diversity of enterprises and functions affected. And now we're living uh, in the current experience of both uh, solar winds and hafnium. And I guess I would say this, that um, these tell us that the scenarios that specialists are so good at generating have become actualized. The injuries that the, we might have forecast some years ago as possibilities are being experienced. And unfortunately, uh, predictions have been um, outdone by accomplishments. And, and so I think as we consider the present and the future, uh, we have to face some difficult truths. Everything is at risk. Adversaries do not confine their attention to defense suppliers, uh, nor are they going to limit um, hostile actions against uh, businesses that do go, bus sorry, businesses who supply to the government. Uh, over the course of years, we've learned a lot, but we still default towards um, incremental or iterative uh, measures. Those are not working especially well, in my judgment. Moreover, we're finding that uh, conflict in the cyber domain is one where you know, the threats can be very uh, difficult to characterize uh, or localize. Uh, borders seem to have no significance whatsoever. And what is the home front is now vulnerable in ways that really we haven't experienced uh, in the US previously. My take is that uh, powered by, if you will, solar winds and hafnium, uh, we're going to see strong and enduring measures by the national government uh, to protect against uh, cyber and scrim threats and how those are combined. Sorry. So, I was a co-author of the MITRE Deliver and Compromised report, which was published in August of uh, 2018. And the report was commissioned by the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence. And our focus was upon protection of the defense enterprise, defense missions, and especially programs for weapon systems. But we were very cognizant of um, other risks that go beyond the defense industrial base. And we sought to write uh, conclusions that might have some uh, relevance, not only for DOD, but for uh, civilian agencies and other companies who may do no business at all with the government. And as I look back at the report, I, I see that we were, you know, either, um, either we had good uh, foresight or we got uh, lucky or both because many of the conclusions that we reached and findings that, uh, uh, we uh, uh, focused upon uh, have proven out and I think are very valuable for enterprises, both uh, supplying to the government and otherwise. A core proposition of Deliver Uncompromised is that we need to elevate the importance of security across the enterprise and at uh, uh, all phases of a program or project from you know inception through to uh, retirement. Uh, the report has had some significance in the subsequent actions of the Department of Defense. Many of you have heard of the CMMC initiative, which uh, in certain respects, uh, uh, some would trace to the deliver and compromised report. Uh, and I think that there's more uh, value in the report that we may see both uh, from government and hopefully industry. So in other programs today, we're gonna to hear a lot about uh, different federal supply chain initiatives. Many of those focus, um, if you will, on the passport and the identity card. That is, who, who is it we're buying from and where are they located? Other aspects of recent initiatives focus uh, not only on the supplier of the part, but even the part of the system. And we look for ways to exclude sources from untrusted or potential ad adversaries. Um, that's good. 
Uh, we also have initiatives that are looking to uh, reduce our dependency upon uh, adversaries or untrustworthy sources and to reshore to the United States our ability to supply uh, crucial uh, services, hardware and software. But beyond those things, there is a different category of uh, problem. And that is that, that cyber actors, whether they be nation state um, or cyber criminals, uh, do target our supply chains. And uh, that means that um, US entities or resources that appear to be based in the United States uh, can be and have been the subject of attack. One of the most troubling aspects of both SolarWinds and Hafnium is the indications that the uh, adversaries were able to, to route uh, these complex and uh, consequential attacks through re US resources. And what this tells us is that you only get so far in relying upon US sources you won't get far enough to prevent uh, vulnerability and consequence to attacks that are mounted through the supply chain. And there are multiple attack vectors. This is drawn from the Deliver and Compromise Report. Uh, much of today's present attention, CMMC and the like, is devoted to protection of information on information systems against uh, cyber IT or network delivered threats. Obviously, that's important. Maintaining the confidentiality of data is a key attribute of a secure supply chain. But there are other attack vectors, and those include um, cyber physical systems, operational technology or factories. Threats through this supply chain could be hardware, software, firmware, service providers, and threats through the workforce. And what we have seen, um, both predicted and delivered and compromised and now experienced, are um, campaigns that are uh, devised and executed by adversaries which will blend uh, attacks uh, through these various and different uh, vectors in order to achieve results that um, exploit vulnerabilities and cause harm uh, in many or all of the vectors. Uh, this is kind of a, a key chart that says what ought to be obvious. What is at risk in the supply chain vulnerability pretty much everything that we rely upon in our way of life in the United States. But there's another part to the chart, to the slide that's indicated by the chart at left. And, and that is a core proposition that I think should guide government and industry today. Um, you can design, develop, build, deploy, and sustain without uh, 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 security engineering. You can hope for the best and try to respond or recover later. But one of the conclusions of the Deliver and Compromise report is that um, your total program cost and the ultimate success of programs will be improved if you invest in security as a foundation of the program, if you engage in uh, system security engineering, if security is an element of all aspects of program design through program completion, this is a big change. And that gets us to some of the core propositions of deliver and compromise. And each of the ones that I picked on the left are not only features of the report, but features which have become recognized and, some, and in some significant respects have become adopted. Um, one of the most important propositions is uh, at the second bullet. That is that security should be treated um, as a fourth pillar. Uh, our, our understanding was that many uh, government and, and industry programs, including management of a supply chain, are, have been done with uh, emphasis uh, upon cost, schedule, and performance. Uh, we suggested that security must be given at equal priority to those three uh, pillars, if you will. In its implementation of the CMMC program, uh, DOD has gone uh, us one better. They've said that security has to be foundational and that cost, schedule, and performance must all rest upon security. That is a proposition with broad implications, and security as applied there uh, extends uh, both uh, to cyber and to supply chain security. Um, I mentioned CMMC. Um, it's a start on supply chain security, but it focuses upon the confidentiality of a particular type of information, government information, which is controlled and classified information. 
And it is true that strong data protection measures are important to supply chain security, but CMMC does not employ specific uh, supply chain measures that would focus more upon the integrity and availability of supplies, of suppliers and services. One of the great challenges as I see it is uh, in the complexities of supply chain. Uh, the context or the individual circumstances of companies matter enormously. And supply chain is different from the perspective of almost um, every company. And one of the great challenges, therefore, is this chaos of sources of threats or vulnerabilities or consequences. And if we are not careful, we're going to create a forest of standards and practices, policies, and procedures, which will read well, but which will be unworkable and expensive and slow. And that's a dangerous combination, especially slow. And they'll be too expensive. So I've been very impressed and have made a tiny contribution to uh, a recent MITRE effort that's focusing upon an automated uh, system or systems of trust. And I try to introduce the concept here. The idea is that um, we need to move to an automated uh, data-driven approach, uh, one that can employ tools such as AI and machine uh, learning. We want to uh, create standardized uh, methods of collecting information, organized uh, priorities for the risks that we are seeking to address. We want to employ a variety of information gathering techniques. We want to produce uh, reports or dashboards for key areas of security. We need these tools to provide actionable results for decision makers. We want to enable government or private companies to select suppliers based on their information of scrim risk. We want to create market incentives for supplier action. And for this to emerge and to succeed, I think it calls for government sponsorship, but for broad application by companies. It's essential that we find a way to use technology to better defend our sources of technology. Too often, we are spending too much time in talk, consider, discuss. Yes, you know, humans may need to make the ultimate decision, but they need to be, you know, on the loop and not, uh, the, you know, the barriers to processing or action at the speed of relevance. Thank you. So great job, panelists. Um, so we heard something about, you know, a little bit of hardware assurance up front by me, a little bit on software assurance and SecDevOps from Rusty. Uh, Dan, you talked about um, the systems engineering pros and how we manage risk. And Bob, you talked about ongoing activities to deliver on compromise and how CMMC may be expanded to get where we need to with product integrity. Um, and I like the idea of going to an automated process. Fundamentally, I think there is an issue of gaining visibility into the supply chain. So how do we best gain visibility? Where do we collect the data? And how do we you know, pass that data on? Uh, I'm going to do in reverse order back uh, the other direction. So give me a sound bite if you would, Bob. Um, closing comments on how we gain the visibility and provide it forward to a user community. Well, that's a that's a great question, Don. Um, information is critical, and right now many companies that are looking at their supply chains are finding that they are short on uh, reliable or verifiable sources of information. There's a number of ways to do it. Um, one is to improve the fact-finding and due diligence that buyers do of their supply chain. Too often, we are asking too little. We don't require that it be updated, and we limit um, our knowledge or we accept limits on our knowledge to just the tier or two you know, below the immediate purchase. I think it is possible for buyers to ask for more information about the supply chain, to engage in selective vetting of the supply chain, and to require higher tier suppliers to find out and to disclose at least certain information about contributors at lower tiers. There also are a variety of supply chain illumination tools that are emerging. These are very helpful. They scour you know, open or dark web sources to gather supply chain information. And ideally, we would uh, combine the information that's available from the suppliers, from illumination tools, and from our intelligence community and law enforcement into what some have called a national supply chain 
intelligence center so that we are collecting and aggregating all of the potentially employable sources of supply chain information. Great, thank you so much. Dan, how about your take on that? So how do I get better visibility in the supply chain and ensure the safety and security? I, I, I also agree it's a great question and I think that there are definitely some uh, tools that have been emerging. I think we need provenance, traceability, and non-repudiation. And I think that one way that we can get that visibility into the supply chain is to take advantage of some of the new tools, such as blockchain, in the ability to have a smart contract uh, that's permissioned uh, that would include what are the data sources that we need that actually uh, provide some quantifiable assurance. So what's the what's the uh, the cost and efficacy of the threats mirrored against the cost and efficacy of the solutions and what data do we need to show in order to provide that quantifiable assurance that we can build into a blockchain model so some of the things that we that that we talked about here as we come up with machine learning artificial intelligence tools that might be able to provide uh, some automated means with built-in self-test of, of anomalies that could alert the supply chain when there are problems. I think that we we have the ability to do that. I think uh, there are things like industry standards that can help define what that means uh, so that we can actually have that visibility that everyone desires that would be meaningful for uh, cons customers, uh, end users, and consumers alike uh, that would matter. So, Rusty, I think clearly during uh, your Sec DevOps presentation, there's value in us moving left, um, but uh, there's also an issue of continuous diagnostics and monitoring. So, often the hardware piece that, that I focus primarily on is built in early, and we don't see replacement parts at the chip level. Um, we do see that sometimes, but not often. In the software world, we see patches every day. So can you comment on the early detection and also the continuous monitoring aspects and continuous update of software? Yes, Don. So you're right. From a software assurance standpoint, software is a constant moving target, and it's beyond just the software that your particular developers are writing. There's a lot of shared code. There's a lot of open source code that's being used and a lot of third-party code that is implemented. And all of this goes into the software supply chain of how these applications are developed and used. The problem is, is the adversaries that are out there will gain your trust. They'll put open source software out that is actually reliable and useful, and you will go ahead and implement it and make it a part of your software security um, and your software supply chain. The problem where you're trusting someone's um, code and they go and make it a malicious code either intentionally or accidentally by writing something insecure, you now have taken on the exposure and the risk of that particular code as well. So in order to have continuous integration, you need to have continual scanning and uh, continuous monitoring of that really comes into the play of using tools such as open source analysis tools, um, software composition analysis tools that go out look for the published CVEs that are associated with different open source libraries that exist. There is a vulnerability database that's published and every time a particular uh, information security type of exposure happens, these are classified and the CVE database will help you understand which one of those that are out there. And in the case of zero day, that's where your static analysis comes into play because you're able to find it at the source where the actual vulnerability exists, maybe even ahead of a published CWE or CVE for that particular type of finding. Great, that was excellent. So I think that in the world of CVE, so just recently, you know, we've been working the CVE world for software and they just established new CVEs for hardware as well. And so the whole idea that uh, Bob talked about, about automating, uh, developing a process and automating it, and Dan illuminated on that as well, um, the idea that you're going to feed CVE, CWE, CBSS on scoring systems and how you automate that overall process is going to be totally valuable to developing what I call that digital thread of information. So that digital thread is what we're going to have is secure information, information we can trust about the hardware, the software, even the services 
that are provided in this technology stack that's consumed at the right side of this slide, if you would, at the systems level, at the sector level, at the operational level, and how they can manage the risk as they build into their ecosystems. Uh, the following two panels later today, uh, one of them will give an acquirer spec, uh, perspective on how do I you know, take data in and manage the risk associated with putting that product into my ecosystem. And the other one is how do I build security into those products and provide that information to the consumer. Thank you guys so much. Excellent presentation, great discussion. Look forward to the rest of the day. Thanks for having us.